Good afternoon. I see that people are still coming in, so we're gonna give just a couple more minutes for uh, people to join and then we will start. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you. Good afternoon, dear guests. We are about to start this event, so please take a seat for those who are still uh, coming in. So thank you very much for being here today uh, and for your interest in this, uh, in this panel. My name is Giacomo Gabrielli. I am the Senior Program Coordinator for Disengagement, Disassociation, Reintegration, and Reconciliation at the International Organization for uh, Migration. Uh, before we start, I want to thank uh, Interpeace and the Disarmament, Demobilization, and Reintegration section in the UN Department of Peace Operations, Office of Rule of Law and Security Institutions, who have joined forces with us uh, to organize this panel. I also want to thank very, very much the uh, staff of the Geneva Peace Week for their great support uh, in the organization of this event. Today's discussion will revolve around the role that mental health and psychosocial support can play in support of DDR programming with a particular focus on emerging practices in contexts characterized by ongoing conflict and by the presence of violent extremist organizations. In recent years, the evolution of conflict contexts uh, increasingly, increasingly characterized by protracted crises, the multiplication, fragmentation, diversification uh, of non-state armed groups and of, by the presence of violent extremism, uh, armed groups designated as terrorist organization, UN sanctioned groups, uh, have raised the need to rethink conventional DDR approaches and to adapt them to contexts where the preconditions for DDR programs are absent. This process has developed in parallel with an evolution of our understanding of what sustainable, uh, effective reintegration looks like uh, in practice in the perspective of both the former combatants and former associates to non-state armed groups and uh, also from the one of the communities that are directly uh, affected by violence. 
This process has led to a more holistic understanding of reintegration, which has come to encompass, among others, social, political, relational, economic dimensions. MHPSS, and mental health and psychosocial support, has therefore come to be a key component of efforts in support of the effective rehabilitation and reintegration of individuals formerly associated with armed groups and forces and violent extremist organizations, of their families, their communities of return, uh, in order to address the uh, consequences of conflict. This event will focus in particular of the, on the potential of community-based approaches to MHPSS to respond to individual, family, and community needs, and to address the consequences of conflict and promote reconciliation and lasting peace. Before we move ahead with the discussion, please allow me to introduce the colleagues and friends who will join us for this discussion. So, starting from Mrs. Abiose Davis, Head of Global Design Monitoring Evaluation and Learning at Interpeace. <laughs> Mrs. Umulkhair Ali Mohammed, connected from uh, Somalia. Uh, she's the case management and gender-based violence officer with IOM uh, in Somalia. Dr. Haider Reeder, mental health and psychosocial support officer with IOM. And uh, last but certainly not least, <laughs> Mario Nascimento, policy and planning officer and team leader uh, at the, the DDR section in the uh, UN Department of Peace Operations. Before giving the floor to our speakers, I would like to invite you all to watch a video that will provide a close focus on how the topic of our, of our conversation is perceived by those more directly exposed to this situation. The video was taken in Northeast Nigeria in May 2023 and relates the perceptions of former associates to non-state armed groups operating in the region, as well as of members of communities of return. Let me just start it. Sun kafu wana abun ya faru. Mumuna tarera kwa nini? Azama na na ati na makaramtu di awa na karanta. Kuma bayan haka na zona ya ikingo nati. Abun ya sami ni baka suma. Dunia tasa ni chewa abun ya sami ni baka suma. Banda ihali da abokaneda. Yang uama, mutaning hak dunia ma, sesun cewa, ni we harus nado isi kawan nak ada. Ay, benda tak boleh hada rai wan zaman dah kita rai wan sesun zaman ada. Kuat kuat dalam. Su karang kansu, bilahi lusi bana sunsu ni suka cinta, dah jinna suka dalam. Nak rai wan dah jauh. Sebab dah hati muda mama tak hanya bosan sini, bapa susah mana dapat nak hari ni dah makan jua, makan jua mahu hari ni semua nak cari dos semua nak cikin jema. Kau mama nak wal walam kemana dah? Bapa macam itu jaga radio, gumnet si tanah pun ya amsa. Aku ya yang gumnet ni tu. Kalau kau tu saya ayam dia yang sama. Isu anak semua. Muda mama nak susu ni muda wajah. Dah jin lebari na abang ya bayar sama nak kerfi. Doming mana suruh kerum muzo, kuma aje way dah mama nak dah cuci ni azab. Ama kini dah cukup macam mana semua mu dah mama bawa cuci dah cuci. Kau dah sejarah mu tarik sini. Dan asal mu iya ni mana kau ni pun cewa yo dah jadi. Kau ayat siya, kau ayat rokal ni mu aboyo si. Kau bapa ni tak cida kapan si, yo bapa ni si. Bukan dia nak nak kau muka bersih ni dalam tak? Jadi kerfit ya seorang kuasa negeri tidak guna tak kau kau muka bersih ni dalam tak? Kau mahu anak joni bayar kerana joni ni zaman yang besar. Dan muka tak sih kuasa tu orang orang ni. Loko cinta mungkin mungkin sokong tak kerfit dia. Nada. Dah mahu bersih kat sini. Kau ini mungkin ada orang ni. 
kuma ya fara kiran wancan mutane din su dawo su dawo kuma mun yi tsammane in suka dawo ma akwai hadari to kuma suka zo din ba yadda muka yi tsammane mu da jama'a din yanzu ba ashe su zaman lafiya suke zo da su kuma yanzu jama'a mu namu suna suna jin dadi zama da su yanzu muna yi abubuwa tare da su ba ma so chef kan su yanzu ba kuma yanzu hakan ma muna akwai yaran ma ma akwai yaran makwaftan mu kusun zo muna ba su fili su zo na ba wani hadari game da su gashi nan tare muke zuwa gona da su kaga in ba sun zo ba ba za mu iya mu je jeji kuno ma ba ba za mu je mu iya mu je mu nema abinci ba amma da suna zuwa din lafiyan yana ta karuwa thank you very much for watching it was maybe a bit long but i think it was important to start this conversation by hearing the voices of those that are more most directly uh, affected by the dynamics by the approaches that we will uh, that we will discuss today i think also that these uh, um, voices highlight some of the key topics that our speakers will, addre will address uh, in the course of this uh, of this conversation uh, just to mention some among others the concerns of communities facing the return uh, of former associates the individual and collective trauma resulting from uh, from the conflict and the need for long term perspectives for reintegration and uh, and reconciliation before addressing all these aspects more thoroughly i would like to take a step back and uh, discuss with our first speaker uh, Mario Nascimento from uh, the DDR section in, uh, uh, in DPO how has DDR evolved over time and how has it come also to encompass a specific dimension on uh, mental health and psychosocial support over to you Mario thank you so much uh, uh, Giacomo I think before advancing, I just wanted to thank IOM, but also Interpeace for, for organizing this event in, in partnership with our team. I think this is a critical time, especially since we are trying to identify and disseminate innovative approaches, best practices in dealing with non-state armed groups. And I would say that uh, in the past 30 years, the United Nations, regional organizations, national governments, but also many other actors, civil society organizations, they have uh, adapted to emerging trends to challenges. But I think uh, you, uh, probably in several of the sessions you have heard that we are facing unprecedented uh, times in terms of crisis, in terms of challenges and ob obstacles. But I think some of the challenges that we have uh, um, uh, tracked um, for the past few years, especially the absence of peace agreement in many of the contexts where we are being called to operate or implement some of these interventions, but also the lack of minimal security conditions that are significantly and directly might pose a threat to our operations. I think, Giacomo, you had the opportunity also to mention the, comple the complexity of the conflict dynamics now with a, move, uh, with a plethora of non-state actors from uh, political military, gangs, militia, um, organized crime, extremist groups, uh, insurgent uh, and terrorist groups. And sometimes with different levels of affiliation in which different scopes of, of strategic objectives. We also have seen more and more the regionalization of violence that requires regional solutions and definitely we have a clear examples from the Lake Chad Basin, Lake Takuguma, but this is something that we see more the expansion, uh, even in context where we, we thought initially were stabilized. Proliferation also of weapons and fragment, uh, fragmentation of groups. Oftentimes we see that some of the non-state armed groups are not so cohesive as we might perceive at first, but have different interests. And obviously we, we the surge of violent extremism and organized crime, obviously we could add many more challenges from climate change, competing priorities, re diminishing funds, but these are the, the, some of the aspects that directly affect our, our work. Uh, considering all these challenges, I think we could, through this uh, uh, quick graph, just uh, highlight how DDR has evolved throughout time. From the first, or the traditional DDR, that mainly focus on dismantling the military structures or with the, with the premise that some uh, preconditions were fulfilled, right? Uh, um, and uh, also associated with a post-conflict scenario. 
Uh, from that, we move towards the perception, the, uh, to the realization that we have to engage communities, be it to prevent the recruitment, re-recruitment of some of the, the, the elements that were part of the groups, but also to build community resilience, uh, uh, and even to increase the capacity of the, the communities in terms of absorbing former combatants. And the third generation builds on the elements that are first and second generation, but I think the main aspect is that uh, we perceive that we have to operate, we have to implement even when uh, conflict is ongoing. And there is an opportunity also to, to target individuals that voluntarily have left the, the armed groups. And I think the fourth generation that we will have also the opportunity to discuss and how DDR processes have been implemented allow uh, targeting members of armed groups designated as terrorist organizations, especially through disengagement, dissociation, rehabilitation, and reintegration programs. But I think one aspect that I cross cutting is to uh, perceive the support, the targeted support to the individual, but also the community-based reintegration as two sides of the same coin. And I think this is where we see especially the provision of psychosocial support, collect trauma, healing, and uh, enabling the, the, the reconciliation. Here, obviously, I don't know if you are familiar with the integrated ADR standards that we are pretty much the document that uh, the system tries to collect in terms of best practices, lessons learned. And one aspect that I wanted to emphasize is that we have moved away from that linear thinking sequence that we had in 2006 for more a much more pragmatical pers perspective in terms of the standards, in terms of each context we will pretty much try to develop the, the, select the approaches that are more feasible or realistic for that specific context. And here, the, the idea would be to, to uh, emphasize the aspect that we are, there is no one size fits all approach. In the end, each context will select the best options, the best approaches, let's say, or, or measures that are fit for purpose from that uh, specific uh, location, for example. We can obviously continue implementing the traditional DDR programs with clear phases and so on, but it also allows us to implement, for example, reintegration support, children, for example, that we can uh, convince the non-state armed groups to release, to support their reintegration, supporting women, acknowledging their diverse roles in terms of promoting gender responsive DDR, and even uh, mediation support to ensure that a key clauses are included from the outset in peace and in the peace negotiations. And I think uh, I also just wanted to, to highlight or even dismantle, let's say, preconceived ideas in terms of how DDR might sometimes clash with accountability uh, expectations. More and more we want to ha highlight the perspective that DDR is an integral component of transitional justice frameworks. But to be successful, uh, um, uh, progress or development has to be made in all the uh, fronts, be it in judicial processes, be it in security sector reform, development as, as well. Okay. Thank you very much, Mario, and uh, thanks a lot yeah, for touching on this uh, last point on the, the, the fact that there is actually no trade-off between accountability and DDR. I think it's very important to uh, underscore this point. Mm -hmm. Just one additional question uh, from my end. How can DDR uh, contribute to peace building in context where violent extremist organizations, armed group designated as terrorist organizations operate? Mm -hmm. Now first I just wanted to highlight the challenges that we have. Uh, as we know, as of now, there is no universally agreed definition of terrorism and violent extremism. So many times we are relying on the legislation passed at the national level or the regional policies, always taking in, into account uh, conventions, uh, Security Council uh, decisions, General Assembly decision, but ultimately seeing the national legal framework. But with, with 27 entities, we have tried to develop a system-wide guidance precisely to how to deal with armed groups designated as terrorist organizations, precisely to have a common denominator, common vision, let's say, that would enable humanitarian development, accountability, but also security actors to, to advance. Obviously, there are multiple perceptions, uh, very also according to, man, to mandate, and concerns in terms of the risks and possibilities uh, uh, as well, be it reputational, be it security, be political, and so on, but always the concern of doing no harm as we advance with some of the, these interventions. 
But I, I just wanted to also to highlight, especially when we engage with armed groups designated, there again, there is no one size fits all. So oftentimes there are preconceived ideas of what DDR is, but multiple variables will influence how the program is designed, how it's in, implemented, be it the nature of the armed groups, the local capacities, the funding availability, the presence of national, each one of these elements, and I don't want to be exhausted, will have an impact. But I think in terms of how we move forward, just uh, highlighting the, the national ownership and the state sovereignty, in the end, always taking into account the international instruments, it's a prerogative, as I, I mentioned, of a national authority states to legislate and indicate what are the sanctions or applicable measures. And based on the clear legal policy institutional framework that we can operate, I cannot stress this enough, but there is no one size fits all. Each uh, context will be unique. And we always try to highlight also the linkages between the national and regional uh, and global global frameworks. Last, I think they, they need to adopt holistic approaches that uh, Giacomo had uh, to, to, to highlight, always trying to complement uh, different interventions. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mario, for this very comprehensive uh, explanation and presentation. I will now give the floor to our second speaker, Dr. Heider Rieder, uh, Mental Health and Psychosocial Support Officer uh, at IOM. Heide, what is the added value of integrating MHPSS in DDR? Um, thanks, Giacomo, and um, good afternoon, everyone here in the room and also join, people joining online. It's a pleasure to be here and to get the space to discuss this together with you. Um, yeah, maybe first we have to look into what are the mental health and um, psycho um, mental health problems people are facing that are actually coming from armed groups to see what is the added value or rather what is the cost of inaction if we don't integrate MHPSS into DR programming. Um, we saw the video and I think it gave a good idea on what the issues are people are facing. Can you hear me well? Maybe I have to bring this closer. Yeah, that's better. Um, and at different elements, um, for those of you who've worked with those groups, um, to see uh, what are people facing when they come back uh, from combat or, as he said, from the bush. Um, meaning people have been exposed to violence, they have been maybe actors of violence, uh, they've witnessed violence and losses also as part of their groups. Um, they have been often separated for years from family members and community members, so previous ties have been cut um, and the, all those aspects can have an effect on the mental health and well-being of a person. Um, at the same time, what we see or what we hear about is um, the question of identity, the loss of identity if people are eventually leaving a group um, because there was a reason why they have joined um, and this is something that um, yeah, also has an impact on the well-being. What, how do I define myself? How do I see myself? Um, and the question, of course, of mistrust, going back, uh, the fear of not being accepted by the community is, a, is a, an important aspect. Here we had very positive voices in the video, but it's not often, or not always the case, rather, that people are received in such a positive way. So all these aspects can have an effect on, on the mental health and well-being and express themselves in signs of distress, um, even to the level of developing mental health conditions. So when we talk about people who have been in active combat, maybe post-traumatic stress disorder, signs of depression and anxiety. Um, and those are all elements that mental health and psychosocial programming needs to uh, um, address in, in, in DDR programming. So he would see the example from Colombia, decades of, um, of conflict, uh, armed conflict. So where there was a huge need to actually integrate, reintegrate um, uh, ten thousands or more uh, of um, of the uh, former combatants back into the community, and I think what we saw earlier with those different generation of DDR um, um, frameworks, it's the same for the integration of MHPSS. At the beginning, it wasn't really there. It wasn't really that relevant. I think it was more seen as maybe f let's look into the physical health aspects because a lot of people come back uh, maybe with disabilities after um, active uh, combat. So 
they had to, take, to be taken care of. And then also it was always a bit the health side. Let's say, let's do health assessment that could include mental health. Um, but the other part of community reintegration, and I will not so much talk about this because um, my colleague Abiyose and also our colleague from uh, Somalia will talk about that wasn't really that important. Uh, it wasn't seen as important. So when you look into the literature, it's quite visible also from Colombia that it was integrated rather late. Um, what does it mean in terms of um, including MHPSS um, in those different, um, yeah, in different, different forms of support? Um, I'm talking here about the examples. I brought a few examples from IOM's DDR program. IOM has been engaged in DDR programming since uh, the beginning of the 90s, starting in Mozambique. So also going through those different generations of DDR programming and has, um, as I said, included MHPSS in its uh, assessments of uh, the, the health and mental health needs of former combatants and also later on ex-associates of um, um, violent extremist groups. Um, IOM uses of uh, this system that is mentioned here, the information counseling and referral service, the ICRS, that some of you might be familiar with. It is a case management uh, tool, let's say, that really looks into the different needs of um, ex-combatants and also their family members, so their dependents. And the idea of this ICRS is to, and that's relevant for DDR programming and also for MHPSS, to have a, a tailored approach. So no, as you said also, uh, for DDR, there's not one size fits all, but to see what are the specific needs needs um, and what are that's that's why we need to ask ourselves what are the right questions we have to ask those people to figure out what they need and how and re reintegration can be successful or not so the ICRS you see there's a lot of different topics that uh, are included um, and MHPSS is one of them uh, as well as health needs legal services people that have no documentations right and education access to livelihood etc I put here already on the right hand side what we will talk more about is the community reintegration part uh, later on, but in my presentation I focus more on the needs of the ex-associates and their peer group. So what you see, what was done also in Colombia is uh, working with youth uh, and adolescents afterwards, including MHPSS and creating a framework on how to how to involve them in thinking about how to prevent future um, violence and contribute to, to reconciliation. And same in, in Colombia, it was included in, in through different healthcare um, providers uh, throughout the countries, uh, throughout the country, and uh, I am supporting um, those uh, because not all of these services will be provided by one organization, by, by different implementing partners, right? Um, and that included also the health partners. They have integrated MHPSS in the transitional justice um, programming, um, which is often very, in that context, very closely linked to DDR. Yeah, so it's not just reintegration, but also we talked about it, collective healing. What can we done to also bring back a sense of meaning uh, after what has happened? Um, I just wanted to highlight uh, the different more uh, specific, uh, let's say sometimes people call them more clinical uh, interventions uh, from the MHPSS perspective. That's maybe counseling, peer support groups that have been provided. Uh, I mentioned in the context of DDR, especially people who have been active uh, in active combat, um, we also look more closely into specific uh, mental health conditions. Actually, in all contexts, people are, uh, talk about substance use. Yeah, people coming from uh, like former combatants, but also ex-associates, dealing with substance use issues, which can have an effect then on on the family level in terms of domestic violence and other forms of um, consequences, as well as specific supports for GBV survivors, for example. All the other parts that 
is not so much or has not been much talked about. It is all the areas of what we include more in the community reintegration work of art space, sports, cultural, yeah, ritual uh, activities that are actually as relevant and needed to be added to the MHPSS part. So the question is, um, why is it important to add, <laughs> come back to your question, um, to add MHPSS um, like into DDR programming? I think uh, we have to look into those different levels of uh, like an individual level, the family level, but also the community level. If we don't address it, um, the grievances, but also the existing mental health problems in the context of return, um, the situation might aggravate. Yeah, and we see that if people don't get a chance to express themselves, um, they don't get a chance to review also what they have gone through, make meaning out of it, uh, and to deal with their strong emotions. Yeah, we're talking about uh, dealing like um, uh, regulating strong emotions and not turning them again into violence. I think this is something that is relevant for all different levels and that we need to include. Um, Going more to the specific context we're talking about today, like ongoing violence, even though Colombia is also still, <laughs> unfortunately, dealing with violence. Um, but talking more about uh, violent extremist groups, um, like IOM is having, it was mentioned already, uh, a regional program in the Lake Chad Basin, uh, which includes Nigeria, Niger, Chad, and Cameroon all in very different stages when it comes to DDR frameworks, uh, also in very different stages when it comes to integration of MHPSS. And um, here are some images you see from Nigeria where uh, on the one hand side you see an IOM staff working with uh, youth leaders, um, like different actors when it comes to community integration to see how they can be connected to the former associates and be supported. You see on the right hand side um, that those are pictures taken from a multi-purpose center in Maiduguri in Northeast Nigeria where People are receiving different forms of supports uh, here, also including like tailoring classes and um, other forms of supports that help them to um, to reintegrate into the community uh, in in the process. And uh, I think this is uh, this is the importance to have this holistic um, support available at different levels um, and see how step by step people are accompanied in their return to civilian life. I want to just, um, do I still have, I don't have the timing, I like, yeah, it's fine. Um, I, as I said, we will talk about, uh, Abios is going to talk more about the community aspect as well as um, Umi from Somalia. I just wanted to highlight um, a research that colleagues just um, finalized in Somalia, and I thought it was interesting to share, to see, okay, what are the different elements included in um, reintegration? Because we talk about, when we talk about um, a context where we have to deal with violent extremist groups, we have to think about why people have joined those groups in the first place, and what are protective factors so that they don't join or rejoin the groups again. And I think those, if we look at those factors, they are the ones that can help us to identify entry points also for MHPSS. Um, because there, there might be the factors that are linked to, to identity, to ideology, um, to social support, and yeah, socioeconomic opportunities, um, and also um, psychosocial well-being and mental health. Yeah, so people who have specific experience in the past and he, who felt marginalized in the past and discriminated, and there, therefore uh, are suffering from certain psychosocial problems, uh, might need this extra support and be recognized um, in, in their own feelings and emotions. And what I thought was interesting here that Somalia, they, they put those seven points together and of course those different uh, supports can action, actually happen in parallel. There's none more important than others, but they describe a little bit what they've done, for example, working with religious teachers very important, uh, and Umi will tell us more about that from Somalia directly. 
in terms of looking at the question of forgiveness. Because actually when you ask them what are the topics people want to talk about in your sessions, they, they mention quite clearly what they want to discuss and what they want to understand. So those are forms to look into questions of ideology, but also in, of questions of forgiveness, because that's a big thing. Will the community forgive me who has done X, Y, Z in the past? And actually people know about it. It's a restoration of family ties, social support. It's something you have to learn again after 10 years in the bush to communicate, to create relationships that support you and it's like mutual support. Um, the question of community trust, we will talk about that later. And then also contributing to um, to the community well-being. And I think this is something that's even part of the mental health definition of uh, WHO. The idea is what can we do to make the person feel better and also be a part of the community and an effective or active member of the community. Um, I brought you three quotes um, to finish, and one is uh, from a key informant in Kismayo, who just said, using art such as painting, drawing, or poetry and uh, helps former associates to express in their experiences and stories. These were often issues that they had previously found difficult to verbalize. So we can use different forms in Somalia. They use, they, they choose different activities. Here, this is specifically from the women's um, DDR program and um, that really speak to people and where they can express themselves. And it was interesting to see uh, when we talked about it uh, that when you prepare those MHPSS activities that you have to think about the sequencing, yeah? In Somalia it was clear that they said under Al-Shabaab it was forbidden to sing and dance and, and do all those things. So when they first came with their arts-based approaches, community-based activities, people wouldn't get, getting, uh, wouldn't get engaged because they felt they were not allowed to. So it actually first needed the interaction of religious teachers before they could start arts-based activities. And um, another quote that I thought was interesting, the most significant change I've observed is that more individuals are finding purpose in their lives. This is after the reintegration uh, programming. They are striving to become better versions of themselves to support their families and communities. This sense of purpose is really vital because people cannot change if they lack a meaningful goal. When community members see that you are capable of change, they will start trusting and accepting you. So those, those are elements that we want to, or changes we want to achieve with MHPSS programming and accompanying people uh, and being the bridge, often the social workers or the, the religious teachers can be the bridge to the community because people can talk about what they really feel before going back. I think I finish here. Uh, I let Umi talk more about uh, other examples from culturally relevant MHPSS activities uh, that they have done um, in Somalia. And just finish with this one quote where I feel like we talk a lot about uh, integration yeah, uh, with uh, with ABIOSI in terms of how to integrate MHPSS into different areas of peace building. And this quote, I thought it was interesting and is a bit of a bridge to what you're going to talk about. Um, while livelihood building is crucial, it will not be effective if the issue of trust and acceptance is not resolved first. In Somalia, everything revolves around trust. No one will buy from your shop if you are not trusted. And how can we build this trust? This is something that MHPSS can contribute to in reintegration efforts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Heide, and uh, uh, thank you for this very comprehensive presentation and for the focus that you have put on the all-important aspect of reconciliation, of the restoration of family ties, community reintegration. This is something that I would like our next speaker uh, to focus on based on her experience. Uh, we have now with us Mrs. Abiose Davis, Head of Global Design, Monitoring, Evaluation and Learning uh, at Interpeace. Abiose, how can MHPSS support, building on what Heide was saying just now, the reconciliation of former associates with their communities? Thank you, Giacomo. Um, I don't have a PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> 
I'll be talking a little bit about an, a pilot experience that we had as Interpeace in um, DRC. So I don't know how many of you guys understand the context of, inter of, um, of conflict in DRC, but given how familiar or popular it is to be spoken about on social media, I think you all know that it's been a context that has had 30 years of cyclical wars. Um, not, I don't think we're talking about conflicts here, we're talking massive scale, right? Um, and we were working in South Kivu, which has been one of the provinces that has been most um, hit by this. And a key, perhaps, message I want to transmit is that um, it's not just how MHPSS can build trust, but also how um, the process of designing and implementing a project that is integrative of MHPSS um, in itself is a trust building exercise. And so the first um, kind of depart point of departure for me is that uh, our project was not a DDR project that was set aside. It was part of a process. Um, it commenced with a um, process of negotiation and mediation uh, to get 22 armed groups in South Kivu to agree to a ceasefire agreement. And as part of agreeing to the ceasefire agreement, that was laying the foundation for the potential to have people demobilized, de uh, disarmed, and reintegrated into their communities. So anchoring the process within this larger um, ambition was really important. And we were lucky that at the same time that we were undertaking this part of the project, the government in itself, the national government, was also designing their own approach to um, DDR and really emphasizing the community-based aspect. And so they were looking for processes that were owned by and led by communities themselves because in such a massive um, country with so many different conflict dynamics, they could have a program, but could that program be relevant to each of the conflict contexts? And I think in Mario's initial presentation, we talked about why um, you know, why the community-based approaches and why MHPSS has become popular. And part of that has been also because of the absence of really comprehensive peace agreements, right? So if you're looking at the um, evolution of DDR, you started off doing DDR in context where after conflict you would have a comprehensive agreement and now the government would have a process and everyone could kind of fall in line to that process. That is not the case, especially with 30 years of cyclical crisis, especially with the government that is perhaps not as um, visible and not as agile in all of the different um, areas that are needed. So really anchoring it in the process provided the legitimacy for um, a pilot. And then the real second part that was really important and how this process in itself was a uh, confidence building process was that we had to secure multi-stakeholder buy-in, right? So as Interpeace, one of the key things that we um, emphasize is our track six approach, like working with actors who are decision makers, working with actors who hold power but are not the official authorities, and then working with communities. And we had to work across all of these levels to get people on board. So yes, you have the national government who's on board. Um, the president gave us a mandate to do this, uh, to do this pilot project. And then we needed to have the provincial authorities on board. So now um, you're engaging the provincial authorities and we have some videos where even they're a little bit suspicious, like are these people coming in to undermine our authority by engaging in this DDR process? What do they want to do? Why do they want to reintegrate these people in a particular way? Um, and then you have those formal authorities, but you also have informal authorities. So you're, um, there's a really close link between the armed groups and people who are powerful players for different ethnic groups, right? So you have customary authorities and you have to make sure they're on board because the these people are all part of the conflict dynamics. Um, and part of how we were able to generate national ownership was all, or local ownership was really putting actors on the ground 
um, in the forefront and having them design what the process was. So they were the ones that were select that selected the approach that would be used. So we elected to use sociotherapy as an approach. They were the ones that set up the committee that would be doing the uh, monitoring of the approach. Um, so they nominated those people and those were the people who then went and identified who were the people that needed to be reintegrated into the community and also who were the people in the community that were at risk and that needed to be part of the process. They identified what site the whole process would, um, where the process would take place. And so really their ownership made sure that everyone felt comfortable about what was um, going on. So that was a process of building trust just to even get to um, being able to undertake um, the activities. So the MHPSS activities and the way in which we integrated them, there were, uh, there was a, so, as I mentioned, it was, we use a sociotherapy approach and the reason was because we wanted to, at the same time, um, deal with some of the mental health and psychosocial needs, as well as rebuilding relationships um, for communities. And it seemed an appropriate approach um, for what we were trying to accomplish. And um, it took the participants through a 15 session um, um, program. And I know Heidi mentioned the seven kind of uh, different components in Somalia. For, um, for this pilot project, we the sessions were divided around issues of restoring security and a sense of security because not only did the um, those who were being reintegrated feel insecure about coming back to communities that people were afraid of them, but those who were representing the community were also worried about um, their tendencies because there were people within that within those groups that were had been you know in the armed groups for long periods of time, a decade, more than a decade, and so were aggressive and were very used to getting what they wanted when they wanted it and would now have to adjust to a new way of life. Um, and then the second part was really about rebuilding trust, and so um, rebuilding trust in themselves and also rebuilding trust with other people. Um, and moving from that, then it was about well-being. How do you take care of yourself when understanding how you're feeling and then how do you take care of yourself in those moments. Um, and then regenerating and rejuvenating respect, mutual respect between the people in the group, but respect at a, at a, in a larger scale. And as well as how do you follow rules now? Because there are different rules that are applied when you are in an armed group than when you're now in a community. So understanding how to, um, you know, how to live with these new rules. And finally, um, emotional management. So how do you manage yourself when you're triggered? Um, so after undergoing um, this process, what we noticed is that those people who were participating from the armed groups had a readiness to be um, reintegrated into their communities. They weren't scared anymore. They were ready to be there. And those who were community members were actually champions saying these they're ready and we're also ready to, um, to invite them back into the community. And um, one of the things that was also interesting or important about the confidence building or the trust building is that it was really important to have people from the community in the spaces, not just um, in the whole process, but in the spaces in themselves, because um, the armed group, the members, the former members of the armed groups were used to exercising a certain level of power over communities, right? They had been um, attacking communities, all kinds of things. So now, we didn't want to give services in a way where they would feel that this was a reward for their position of power within the community. So it was important that that was balanced out with the presence of members of the community to create a certain sense of we're all equals here and I'm coming back into a community as an equal. Um, and perhaps 
the last point I wanted to make is that uh, once that process was, once they'd gone through sociotherapy, the next part of the process was really um, a collaborative livelihoods approach. And so at Interpeace, we kind of talk about this triangle of MHPSS, social cohesion, and livelihoods development. And where many DDR programs perhaps provide funding or kits, et cetera, we are really encouraging the livelihoods dimension to be seen as consolidating the cohesion that has already been built in within the groups that are going through the psychosocial support. And so we helped them identify what were viable um, livelihood options or viable business options within their communities and they identified milling because I think there were they have a, they were producing a lot of grain but there was no milling factory in their community and also the production of soap and so they would have to go long distances in order to purchase soap in the site that they were um, that, that the reintegration happened and so they started a soap making factory and this milling factory and together they developed a um, a, a cooperative association through that and that was belonging to the community and providing the services to the community. And we are now, I think, three or four years post um, that pilot, and those um, businesses are still working, and the people are still together, and they're still um, running the businesses together. Um, what was also really beautiful about the processes because I started off saying that it needed to be anchored into something. It was also giving back to the thing that it was anchored in. And um, at the end of the process, um, the lessons learned and the experience was reshared with the government officials and that helped to set up a roadmap for how um, the DDR process, the community-based DDR process would be run in that province in South Kivu. So um, going back to what Mario said, this is very contextually specific and so it's not just contextually specific per country but also even within a country. So a country is massive as, as the DRC, you can have a national program, but it needs to also be owned and managed at um, a subnational level. And so we contributed to really shaping the plan at the subnational level. Um, so I hope that helps to bring a little bit more kind of from the theory to the practice and what the experiences might look like in a place um, like the DRC. Thank you very much, Abiose. There were there was so much in your in your presentation that I won't even try to summarize. But it's uh, uh, really great to hear about your experience, the approaches, the challenges, the the, the focus on some specific aspects that uh, that came from uh, uh, from your experience in in DRC. Uh, I will now give the floor to our fourth speaker uh, connected with us from uh, from Somalia, uh, Mulher Mohamed Ali, Case Management and GBV Office uh, at the IOM Mission uh, in Somalia, and building on uh, the experience that uh, Abiose has just uh, related to us. Uh, um, Umulhair, what was the experience in Somalia and what key similarities and differences uh, are there uh, with the other context that has been described so far? Over to you. Uh, Giacomo, can, can you repeat your question? There's a, re a bit of internet problem, so. Absolutely no problem. Yes. No problem whatsoever. I was saying, basically, tell us about your experience in Somalia and how it relates to the different uh, experiences from other contexts uh, that have been uh, related so far. What are the key similarities, uh, the possibly the differences, the lessons learned that emerge uh, from Somalia in comparison to the other contexts that have been uh, discussed so far? I don't know if you could hear me uh, over to you. Thanks. Yes, I can hear you now. I can hear you. Uh, thank you so much for for your question. Um, I'm glad I'm here today discussing more about Somalia and DDR. This has been a topic of interest for me for the last 10 years. And uh, um, I have been working with the DDR program for quite a while. Um, so I was looking forward to this uh, discussion today. So you said the key similarities with other contexts. Um, like other contexts, Somalia, uh, defectors uh, from uh, Al Shabaab and Ang group from Somalia face challenges such as stigma and distrust from the community. 
uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, hate towards uh, defectors and many communities are uh, hesitant uh, to open up and uh, you know and there is a fear still that they may still pose uh, a threat so um, working with GDR in Somalia has been a bit challenging because uh, overcoming all those uh, distrust, all those uh, emotions, negative emotions that the communities have towards these defectors was an uh, important uh, uh, thing. Another key similarity that I can think about is trauma. Trauma is universal. Every uh, returnee or every person who was once working with armed groups uh, come back with some sort of trauma whether it's uh, PTSD, depression, anxiety, and all sorts of things. So uh, in other regions, uh, beneficiaries from GDR program in Somalia, uh, it was critical for them to participate in the MHPSS uh, activities for them to reintegrate back to the community. Um, we also have a few key differences like a dimension in Somalia, this, the role of region is particularly strong. Um, People are really religious and uh, um, religious leaders uh, are really involved in the MHPSS activities. And they are, we have hired uh, some religious leaders in the centers, whether it's the rehabilitation or integration phase, and they are there to support uh, um, the returnees uh, through providing moral and ethical, uh, and also clearing the et ethical dilemmas. Um, and also generally, uh, they were helping communities to reconcile. Um, apart from the key similarities and, uh, and the differences, MHPSS was not part of uh, IOM Somalia uh, from the beginning. It was something that was incorporated later on when we saw that there was a need for, uh, after conducting some peer assessment, we saw that there is a need for comprehensive uh, MHPSS integration. Um, and it was integrated uh, uh, to address, th as we said, there's a lot of trauma in them, to address deeper emotional uh, scars that they, uh, and the psychological challenges that they went through uh, when they were with the armed groups. So we ensure that we have a very holistic approach uh, to support these uh, defectors, apart from providing vocational skills, education, civic and all that, it was also important to reintegrate MHPSS activities into uh, both rehabilitation and reintegration. There's, uh, in Somalia, there's a lot of challenges faced by former uh, associates. Um, they face a wide sweep of st stigma. There's a lot of mistrust within the community. There's a suspicion. Uh, and sometimes you don't blame the communities for feeling like that because Somalia has been, there was an ongoing conflict in Somalia for quite a while, for 30, 30 years now. And uh, armed groups has been operating in that country for more than 20 years now. So there's a lot of distractions, there's a lot of uh, loss of life. So the communities are a bit hesitant to accept these uh, returnees, these defectors back into their homes and into their villages. Um, the challenges uh, from the communities uh, are not only the, the, the emotional and social challenges, there's, this, uh, there's also challenges within the beneficiaries themselves. Uh, there's guilt and they feel that they are isolated from the community and they often, uh, as Heidi mentioned, struggle with their own, own identity. So, um, seeing all that and uh, realizing that um, not only the education support and the livelihood and the uh, uh, stipend and all these things, we also need MHPSS support and uh, we put more focus on MHPSS activities. So um, most of the activities that were conducted uh, in, 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 in IAM DDR Somalia and um, high dimension them, I'm, I'm, I am uh, talking right now, I want to talk about community perception and, and, and reconciliation. So um, we, we as a Som I am Somalia staff, we saw that uh, community acceptance is a critical uh, tool for successful reintegration. Uh, one of the quotes in the presentation was, uh, in Somalia, trust is everything. Um, even if these beneficiaries or these people went through rehabilitation or reintegration, going back to the community, and being a sex, uh, 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 
attending uh, community activities, uh, talking to neighbors, having friends, um, associating with relatives, it was really hard for them. So uh, even if they went through uh, a, a lot of uh, support, a lot of financial support, it was important for also the social aspect and uh, and the uh, and, and the social cohesion aspect. Um, so <coughs> we worked with the communities. Uh, we came up with different acti activities, uh, and we worked with the communities to try to support them and shift their attitudes. Uh, by fostering understanding, forgiveness, and reconciliation. So one of the activities that was uh, most important that we did was uh, coming up with co community development projects. So when we were conducting the community development projects, uh, the uh, former associates were leading the, the, the discussions within the communities, not only them, but we also had mentoring support, uh, mentors who were uh, uh, hired to support the process. Uh, we also had social workers. We had uh, um, um, other 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 staff, and uh, we wanted to give a picture to the community that these people came back and they are ready to to reintegrate back to their community. They are ready to do away with the violence and they are ready to support. So uh, those uh, activities were successful in bringing together uh, communities and. Uh, and the former defectors, because we use that as a platform where they can have discussions. Uh, because we also have the religious counselor, and remember, Somalis and religion, uh, they're, 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 uh, 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 they have strong region, religious links. So um, those platforms, the community used uh, to ask questions to the defectors. And the defectors had the opportunity to talk about their problems. And uh, we also had uh, sometimes clan elders, some clan uh, uh, leaders who were there in the meetings. Uh, they discussed different projects. Uh, they will go to the community, IDP camps, and try to find uh, a place where they can uh, sit down and, uh, and, and, and discuss and, and talk about things. So um, it was a very successful uh, activity. Apart from that, there was the religious counseling and mentoring. So um, after they come back from uh, from arms groups, these people have been, uh, some of the beneficiaries have been there for quite a while. So when they come back to Somalia, uh, or let's say when they join the rehabilitation and reintegration centers, they have a lot of questions. Uh, some of the things these arms groups use uh, to, uh, uh, to talk about them is uh, they use region as a tool to uh, change their mind. So they had a lot of questions. Uh, sometimes they used, to, they used to ask us, we didn't think this is possible. Uh, we did not think the, 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 the community is like this. Uh, some of the things they had a lot of questions where uh, the religious counselors were there and they played a significant role in the, in the reintegration process. Uh, by offering spiritual guidance and also uh, helping them generally to uh, mitigate their dilemmas. We also had mentorship program where people who were formally, uh, who formally graduated from the centers uh, and from the re reintegration program came back to the program as mentors. And they have, uh, they were talking to these beneficiaries and trying to understand their uh, that their problems, their issues, their challenges, because who knows uh, 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 ch those challenges more than them, because they went through those challenges themselves. So, and they became successful and they reintegrated well to the community. So also the mentoring she program was, was really uh, successful and they got uh, both emotional and uh, psychosocial support. Um, so uh, in, we say that we, there are beneficiaries who graduated from the program before the starting of the MHPSS activities. And we have beneficiaries who graduated after we started these activities. There is a key difference in their approach uh, to community reintegration. You will see most of the beneficiaries who graduated after starting the MHPSS activities uh, are more confident. Um, they, read, they, they are more hopeful for the future. And uh, uh, some of them can express themselves clearly. And, you know, they, those are the ones who also came back to the program as mentors. So these, these differences uh, before and after starting the MHPSS activities. Um, 
So um, all I can say today is that um, MHPSS played an integral part in, 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 in the DDR activities, and it was important for, for, for these beneficiaries. Uh, for the journey for their integration was not easy. Uh, it, it didn't come easily, as, as, as some of us might uh, uh, expect. And uh, I feel that with continuing support on mental health and psychosocial support, we can transform uh, lives and also reduce violence and, and can also uh, contribute in building resilient communities. Um, I think that is, that's all from my side. Thank you very much, Musaid. It was extremely interesting to hear from you, to hear from your experience. So really, thanks a lot for this very comprehensive presentation on the work that you and your team have been doing uh, in Somalia. We are running slightly behind schedule, but I would uh, still like now to open the floor for any questions, for uh, any intervention, um, or any point that you would like to raise. So please feel free. I see two hands, three hands already up. Uh, a colleague is going to come and join you with, uh, with a microphone. So in strict order of me seeing your hands up, <laughs> I would say Shoban first, then you, ma'am, Francesca, then yes. Thank you. Thank you for a great panel. Um, my name is Siobhan O'Neill, and I lead the Managing Exits from Armed Conflict Project, which follows people out of armed groups and their unaffiliated peers for a period of years. And I'm here with my colleagues. I have two questions for you. So the first is to build on this question of what are the right questions to assess needs. And this is something that we deal with in the field. In some places where we work, linguistic frames for mental health don't really exist. Um, Western-style PTSD questions in the middle of an active conflict are completely inappropriate. And daily functioning questions don't really work in the middle of a humanitarian crisis where not getting out of bed means you don't eat and you don't live. So I think there is this real challenge, particularly in a lot of the places where I know all of you work, how do we assess accurately needs, um, both immediate and maybe longer term? So that's a question to the panel. And then another one is, you know, what is, what is MHPSS? Where is the line? Because many of the things that I heard the panelists describe are really social norms interventions, their livelihoods plus, their network building. And I think all of those things obviously contribute to better psychological or mental health outcomes, but they may not be first order outcomes. They might be secondary outcomes. And yes, this may seem like an academic debate or a branding issue, but I think there's an issue of scale here. So what do we need clinicians for? And what in everyday programs can be enhanced to have mental health and psychosocial benefits, even if you don't have a clinician there? I am struck over and over again about the type of projects and programs that have these benefits, but that's not how they're marketed or branded or funded. I mean, I run a research project, and we have ex-combatants who call up our local office in my degree to check in because we're the only person who ever asked them how they were. And so I think as a research project, when we see that effect, I think there's so many other programs that could have that possibility, and that's a scale issue. We could do a lot more um, with people who aren't experts. So two questions to the panel, and thank you so much. Hey, hi, my name is Alejandra Quintana. I'm from Colombia, um, and I work uh, at the NGO Alianza para la Paz, and we work with Interpeace in a project with the Colombian National Police. Um, and we work in um, peace building with a gender approach. Uh, and I have a question um, about, I would like to ask you what you find uh, or what you found in terms of the difference on particular needs of uh, mental health and psychological, um, uh, psychosocial support and mental health um, for men and women, for girls and boys, because uh, we know that the effects of violence are, are different. No? Uh, and what strategies uh, did you use? 
Thank you. I think we can take the third question and then the, the panelists can come in and reply. Thank you. Good evening. Francesca Grandi from Transparency International. Thank you very much for all the fascinating presentations. Um, I would like to ask the panel if you believe that anti-corruption measures can strengthen the effectiveness of DDR programs um, by acting as conflict prevention measures. And just to demonstrate that I'm not hijacking the conversation away from um, MHPSS programs, uh, I actually see uh, a great deal of compatibility between anti-corruption measures and um, MHPSS um, programs. Uh, I'll try to be clearer about that. I think on the combatant side, both the individual and the group level, they uh, can actually uh, help the trust building processes that you all mentioned, and also create a stronger sense of socioeconomic security, which I'm sure it is in an integral part of uh, feeling both the incentives and the willingness to going and being reintegrated in a community. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, we want to go first. Sure. Thanks. Thanks so much for, for those interesting questions. I feel like the first two questions, they included <laughs> five more questions, so let me see uh, how I can respond to that. Um, I totally agree. We would not, uh, in that context, come with the language that I mentioned here. As I talk about uh, mental health conditions uh, and mental health problems, and can I give you those terms? This is not the language the, we then uh, use with the community. But still assessing you can break it down uh, into different elements that people know about. Yeah, Levels of distress you can assess. Um, and I think it's important to look into those measurements. So what uh, has been done in different contexts is understanding what is like social well-being. Yeah, you can develop your own scale based on a specific local context uh, by asking people and then seeing what speaks to them, what they understand by psychosocial well-being. Um, I think all the different elements that we talked about, what, inc what is included in, in the MHP is you have to break it down and see what it what works in a specific context. And I'm just giving the example of psychosocial well-being um, because in an idea world, we would do those, uh, develop those scales in different contexts we work. Often there's no time, there's no money to do that, maybe not the expertise, but that would be uh, the most appropriate to use the words of the community to also measure changes from their perspective. So I think um, when we assess needs, we have to look into those different elements that I mentioned earlier, also in that context around uh, not only um, levels of distress or symptoms, but also elements of social support. How does their social support network look like? Um, also the quality of social support. Don't ask just for how many people do you see uh, each week, but also how, what does the quality look like? What are you getting out of those relationships? What is the mutual support system? System. How are you integrated into specific community networks, talking about social capital? I think that's crucial when people return. Um, talking about aspects also about the broader concepts that we mentioned here, identity, yeah, and, and struggling maybe with identity. Emotional regulation, that's something that is relevant. It has been mentioned several times. So I think we can break it down to see what are the different elements we have to look into. Umi also mentioned uh, the question around forgiveness and so on. I think this really depends on your program, what you want to include, do you want to go into that area or not. Um, but I think this is important at the beginning to describe what are the different elements we are tackling with our program um, and what are the questions or what are the needs we need to assess. And it's doable, but I think, yeah, it's, we need to, to do that in each context specifically. And I wanted to say in that sense, you mentioned there are specific MHPS outcomes and there are outcomes that deems, I can't remember how you framed it, but um, that mar where we have maybe benefits in terms of psychosocial well-being, but they're not specific to an MHPSS activity. And I think that's fine. I mean, we can have specific activities that are really looking into improving uh, mental health and psychosocial well-being. We have others where we look at it from a psychosocial lens and we, we see there are different elements contributing to well-being as well. And they are maybe linked to all these activities we were talking about, yeah, social 
cohesion activities, uh, ritual activities. They're not MHPSS per se, but they are part of it because it is important, right, after conflict to bring people together and find the right rituals so that people can reunify. Um, I think it's more a question of, yes, we don't need clinicians for this. I think this is quite obvious. We need um, the clinical piece for people who really um, have mental health conditions, and that's what we do. We work with wherever there is services available. We do that, we refer to psychiatric hospitals if there is any uh, hospital available. Or we work with community health centers. There's an uh, ambition to bring MHPSS into primary health care services where you can do a lot without being a psychiatrist. So you need at some point someone being able to assess and maybe also provide treatment, but that's a very small number. The majority will benefit from other activities and there we don't need necessarily a clinician. And we've heard that before. We have social workers, we work with um, religious leaders or t uh, um, teachers. Um, we can, that can be a nurse providing uh, psychoeducation, explaining people, like we do a lot on awareness raising, right? Um, so. There's a lot of things you can do without having a specific MHPSS background, but with the right training and supervision. And this responds maybe to your question of scaling. I mean, this is where we can scale up. Uh, in the humanitarian context, there is a lot developed over the last years, um, different interventions that are used by non-MHPSS or staff by lay counselors. Um, it comes with a lot of supervision and requests for ongoing supervision and training, so it's not easy to implement and to scale up. Uh, but a lot of these community-based activities, of course, you can scale them up. I think why they are maybe less known uh, or seen as the other mental health pieces, it's because we don't measure the outcomes properly. Yeah, so I think we, we discuss it often, monitoring evaluation uh, on, on integrated programs. So you need to sit down, okay, what is the outcome of my activity, uh, the intended outcome in terms of social cohesion? It's definitely, we will not measure social cohesion, right? But we have to break it down into the different elements like trust building or social connectedness. Uh, and then we can, before and after, we can measure uh, changes in psychosocial well-being of an individual, uh, family, yeah, reduction of tensions, reduction of violence in the family. Um, but again, we need to make that effort to break it down and to find the right terminology and then it's doable. Um, I won't repeat what uh, Heidi said. I think she answered really um, similarly to how I would have answered to the first question. Uh, just to add a couple of points, I think the first thing is just that before we even get to measurement, the precursor is a, a certain level of stability and security for people to be able to even engage in this in these activities. Like, you're absolutely right. How do you ask people if they're anxious, if they are living in an outright open war zone? I think it's hard to imagine that people will not be anxious. So there's certain, there's, I think there's certain considerations for also um, just what is, ethical even in a in in different contexts um, and um, and then the second point is just that there also we have to be mindful of um, leaving room for evolution I remember that there had been a few um, research that had been done in northern Uganda, let's say, just after the conflict, and then um, I think five years afterwards, and the needs changed quite a bit. So initially, everything was connected to very basic needs, and um, there were other needs that seemingly were not necessarily affecting people psychosocially, because and, and the initial needs were just to be able to eat, et cetera. Um, and five years later, um, the um, the same research demonstrated that people were now asking for things like justice. So maybe this links to the last question in terms of anti-corruption. So people's needs also evolve as the situation evolves as, as time goes on. So I think that's just something to um, leave room for. Um, in terms of thinking about scaling and what's done by clinicians and what's done by um, others, I know that there are lots of different efforts that are much more community-based and that's maybe part of what 
I hadn't expressed in my own uh, description of our approach is that we actually work through community facilitators. So the group sessions were not facilitated by a um, psychologist, although we did have a supervision team of two that were um, there to support, but most of the discussion was led by um, community facilitators who come from those places themselves. And that is also part of a sustainability strategy that these people can still be in the community as a resource and are able to reach more people than just the people in the group mm -hmm. that they're working with. So, um, so I think that there is this when we, um, one frustration, I think Heidi would know this um, from our discussions, that is when we're talking about the integration, I think people from the mental health world tend to think about um, really a mental health expert. And then people from the peace building world, because we're not so used to engaging on the topic, are like, yes, we need an expert. And then, and that lead, that closes the room for so much creativity in the space that can, is there for actually people who are not experts to be able to um, provide support. I mean, many of us probably have friends or confidants in other ways in which we manage um, some things, not all things, but um, just you know, adding to what Heidi said about also being able to have referral systems and knowing and having people have enough information to know when is the support that they're providing mm -hmm. at its limit and it needs um, additional support. Um, you asked the question about the difference in needs for men and women, and um, I just wanted to maybe jump in a little bit on that. But these are, I think they're really quite stereotypical, and what's important is really each context has its own variations. I think we tend to see that um, maybe s some of the ways in which men's um, challenges express themselves are more externalizing in terms of aggression or substance abuse, et cetera. And we see a lot with women, a lot of like anxiety or depression. But one thing that's also interesting is also the factors that are contributing to that. So of course, um, our assumption would be that the biggest factor might be the exposure to the conflicts themselves, but in different cases, like for um, some of the women we've worked with, it's been the inability to have children is actually more of a factor that is affecting them than necessarily perhaps what they um, observed or experienced during a conflict. And for men, it's maybe the inability to provide for their family as a key barrier. So. Um, but I think the biggest thing is not treating any group as homogenous. So just as everyone who's gone through a conflict is not suffering from a mental health condition, um, not every man is experiencing it the same way and not every woman is either. And maybe I, I, I'm sure you want to answer the question for, I just wanted to add like in terms of the gender dimensions of the needs, uh, especially in the context of DDR, and uh, if you, if you, I invite you, if you're interested, there are some um, studies uh, that IOM did um, in the lecture at Basen on those specific elements like gender dimensions of DDR. I think the differences is also in terms of how they have been involved in uh, armed groups or violent extremist groups. What was their role? How did they join the groups? Uh, often women are perceived as less dangerous, less uh, like really uh, active of such groups, even even though they might also be low risk uh, associates as much as men. Um, but because of the different functions they were having in uh, violent um, extremist groups. And I think there's also difference in terms of how they get out of groups and how they rejoin the community. Is it through formal ways? Is it through informal ways? Maybe men use more formal ways through the clan leadership. Maybe women have other ways of how they get back to the community. So I think it's again, as usual, very complex, um, but it's it's worth looking into those specific uh, contexts because, like, we can talk about Al Shabaab, but also maybe in other contexts, um, it would be similar to see what are the specific needs uh, in terms of, especially uh, in Somalia, we had the example of a rehabilitation center for women, and they had different services, and they, for example, they were they continued to uh, to live at home in the in the community. They didn't stay overnight while the men were staying overnight. So the program is already responding to that, um, just to say it's, it's worth looking into those different questions as well. 
No, just to try uh, to complement, because I think especially in the scaling up issue, uh, just express concern as we see diminishing uh, resources, for example, in, across contexts of competing pri priorities. Uh, but the, the the positive aspect is DDR, or like uh, let's say the provision of uh, MHPSS, it's not static in time, right? For example, you see many contexts where uh, gradually capacity was built. For example, in 2006, back in Colombia, there was a proportion of one social worker to 1,000 to 2,000 combatants. So there was so much you could do. But uh, gradually, we were building the capacity, both the international actors, but national actors, to reduce that proportion, that ratio from one social work to 1,000, 2,000, to one to 100, one to 40. And when you uh, have that ratio, you can provide a better service. In terms of uh, uh, assessing needs, I, I think uh, uh, both colleagues already highlighted key points, but I would take a, a step back in terms even uh, allowing, not allowing, uh, ensuring that they are part of the process. Many of the DDR processes are male-centric, one weapon to, to uh, one combatant, or women uh, are fear stigmatization, for example, so they are not even exposed to any type of intervention, much less having their needs needs assessed. For example, in, in Somalia, we knew that uh, women were part of Al Shabaab for years, but it was it took years to have a framework to have a uh, an intervention. And to, to the point of uh, corruption, I think it's uh, essential, especially when we, we were talking about building trust in the process, building trust among communities, all the benefits to, to ensure that uh, when it goes to the individual, when it goes to the community, it goes to the right place. And I think that it's even uh, uh, more of a priority when we are dealing with certain groups, for example, to ensure that the resources are being properly allocated, uh, not misused. Thank you very much, Mario. Just building on this last point, yes, we have spoken a lot about the trust between uh, uh, former combatants, former associates and communities, but there is an additional dimension that is extremely important, which is the one between former combatants and the government that is running uh, uh, these processes. And I. I can talk on this out of personal experience uh, from implementing and being in direct contact with former combatants, uh, notably in the Central African Republic, where this dimension, this need to rebuild this trust was very, very strongly felt, uh, once again, between former combatants and the government, but also between former combatants and international practitioners. Because sometimes, um, with this kind of programming, you find yourself in a situation where, um, this trust needs to be reestablished, and sometimes it goes through a process uh, that is not necessarily the smoothest or the most reassuring also for, for the practitioners. But yes, uh, to answer your question very synthetically, absolutely, uh, this is a very important uh, component that needs to be taken into account and that can play a significant role uh, in rebuilding this network of trust. I think we are already, yes, let's take one more question. We are already beyond time, but uh, yeah, let's take one more question. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Can you take the microphone? Do we have the? People can hear you online. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, question about the guidelines that the IASC uh, published in January of this year. Um, on guidelines for integrating MHPSS in peace building. I'm just wondering, first of all, how well known are these guidelines actually in practice and how useful are they? And just your reaction and what's the future for, uh, yeah, getting out of the silos and we, we have a lot of good guidance um, and I just wondered about this. I think the, the case studies, by the way, Colombia, Sri yes. Lanka, South Sudan, yes. and Philippines might be of interest to people here as well. Yeah, it's true. Um, yeah, we can promote a little bit the guidance because <laughs> we were both uh, part of the working group, the peace building group uh, that has developed this document. I know it's a big document, it's um, 200 pages, but the guidance is 70 pages, so I can also invite you, if you don't have that much time, look into the policy brief that we developed, 20 pages, there you have the overall like recommendations. I think it was really a lengthy process, a lot of people involved, and um, it is not the only guidance, there was one that was developed by UNDP before. I think it helped us, because sometimes people are asking, 
How can you write that integrating MHPSS will improve peace building outcomes? Because sometimes we, as I said, we don't have um, evidence base and people are always asking for evidence, right? But we have a lot of evidence from narratives, from stories, from projects where we see uh, what's changing if we integrate MHPSS. So now with those documents and with the, especially with the IEC one, um, we have some language that people can use for advocacy that they can look into to understand what are actually the different areas of inter integration. Yeah, I mean, now we talk about DDR, but we could talk about social cohesion, GBV programming, um, and uh, prevention of violent extremism. Um, there's there's so many different um, areas of peace building where this could be integrated. So. This, the first idea is using it as an advocacy tool, giving people some language who try to integrate more, like do it more integrated work, um, sharing it with donors, uh, those ideas, uh, and um, suggesting new new projects. Um, so this is the, the first step. Um, now the next step is, I mean, we launched, uh, we did two country level launches of the guidance in Iraq and actually Colombia, right? And um, the next step is to making it more operational, so to help people to look into monitoring and evaluation, evaluation indicators, uh, how to set up a program that is integrated, how to present it, um, how to work on the coordination mechanism. So it's more like implementing, we're at that stage, how can we best implement the guidance? how much it has been used. It was just published in January, so I, I'm happy to get feedback <laughs> from you. Uh, go through it and tell us. Um, we're in that process to getting feedback from people and asking people how has it helped you in your work, um, what, which piece speaks to you. But the operationalization now through more trainings, capacity building, more mentorship of countries or projects who want to implement more integrated program, that would be the next step. Maybe you want to add on that? Uh, uh, can we just say it just yeah, very yeah, quickly because there's quick another panel. I mean, uh, 10 years ago, it was really a struggle to convince people who were funding peace building to fund an MHPSS component because they thought that that is too clinical of a thing and that they that's what they're funding under health. So I think a key um, value of such documents is that we're now changing the narrative and looking at and being able to actually advocate for more integrative programming. So um, in that sense, I think it's accomplished that task. But as Heidi said, the next step is operationalization. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for this very interesting conversation. I wish we had more time to further dwell into the different topics, but uh, I hope it was interesting for you. Uh, for you. Um, I want to thank once again uh, the DDR section in DPO, here represented by Mario. I want to thank Interpeace through Abiose. I want to thank Umul Khair for being available from Somalia to, to join us today. Haide, of course. And uh, uh, a big thanks also to the staff of the Geneva Freeze Week for their support, and first and foremost to all of you for your participation today. Thank you very much, and have a good rest of the afternoon. Thank you.